for a lot of theists where they put limitations on AI. And I don't know that that's really thought out. I think it's just a reflection or reactionary response. Like, oh, it can't be that good. It can't be as good as a human. Humans are unique, but they don't understand why humans are unique. And so they're limiting themselves in that an understanding of what AI can or may possibly be able to do and what we're working towards to make it do. Um, does that make any sense? Could, could you summarize that in one sentence then, what the issue is? The issue is I think people who have a, let's say a basic understanding of theology and philosophy. So let's say they, they're theists, they believe in a God, over emphasize the creative nature of humanity and therefore downplay the potential of AI. Oh. Does that make sense? It does. And does that frustrate you? Um, yeah, I would say frustrating is probably a good word for it. Uh, you know, it's like anything. I, I don't know that it's intentional. It's probably a little bit of a fear, right? Like if what's, let's say the, the furthest reaches of, you know, AI prognosticators, what they say is true, which is the knowledge economy is going to get decimated and all thinking will be replaced by robots in the not too distant future. Okay, and you're a fill in the blank, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, a graphic designer, whatever, a marketer. Everything you've known and learned, and like, you know, I got to pay the mortgage this month, and I got to take my kids to soccer practice. And I got now you're going to tell me I got to figure out how to survive in this world where everything can be done better than I can do. And I've been training for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years to be good at. Like, most people are going to put blinders on and just say, there's no way that's true. I'm not even contemplating <laughs> that reality, right? And it's hard to say how far AI is going to go, right? Anyone that's trying to predict that and say, this is the upper limit uh, beyond the, the spiritual nature, which we've already discussed, right? So that the consciousness factor, but as far as what practically can it achieve? you're setting yourself up to be surprised and probably not in a good way. I'll give you an example. Greg and I have a cousin that's a truck driver and he refuses to accept that truck drivers will ever be replaced. Like we bring it up to him like at some point, it might not be next year, yeah. but the reality is, and he's like, well, somebody still has to unload the trucks and somebody still has to do the paperwork or somebody still has to, you know, back it into these really you know, tight spaces and I'm not saying that doesn't take skill and like, and I certainly can't do that stuff. But to say a machine will never be able to replicate that or a series of machines. So there's a robot that unloads the truck and there's a different robot that drives the truck and so on and so forth. I think is, is a fear, right? Like if I can't see in my own life, how do I replace what I do that I'm good at, that I'm successful, that supports me when a robot can, can come in and do what I do. It's just easier to turn on Netflix and say, yeah, that's not going to happen. So how are you trying to help your cousin then rather than him burying his head in the sands? Like, how are you trying to help him? I mean, you have to want help. That That's just the reality of anything. If I have a conversation with my six-year-old and she's upset and she's emotionally like stressed. It doesn't matter how much I want to help her. It doesn't matter that the information I'm giving her is going to make her safer or happier or whatever. She has to be ready to accept that. Well, guess what? That's true for adults as well. The reality is most of us don't want help in areas where we think we know what we're talking about. And so breaking through to that, I don't think you can do it directly. You you probably recognize this as well. To some degree, when you're too close to someone, they're less likely to trust you. Um, what's the, the the quote from the Bible? Is a prophet's never believed in his own town. I'm paraphrasing there, but that's essentially what it is. Like you know, hey, we knew this this prophet. He grew up right here, and we know his parents. There's no way he's somebody special. So 
I think that the best way that we can help is continue to talk about it and continue to, to share with people. Yes, there are limitations to what AI can accomplish in terms of goal setting and its training data and not being able to define morality. And like, that's all part of what we have to train in. But when it comes to practical, can I understand law better than a lawyer that's been doing it for 30 years? Probably, if you have the right training data set. So what I've seen, Rob, is you have to, I've seen two different studies. So one study showed you can reduce the cost of legal contracts by 99.97%, right? Now, the thing with that is these are federally based contracts in the U.S. So they're based on federal law, which is all of it's published online. So all the Supreme Court rulings, all the, the federal courts, they're all published. And so the large language models, ChatGPT and Claude and uh, so on, are trained on the federal law. But if I'm dealing with an issue that's related to my state and county and municipality, and we have unique laws here about the taxing code or something like that, it's terrible at that right now. Not because it's fundamentally flawed in the structure of the GPT, just because that data hasn't been, it hasn't been trained on it yet. And there is some nuance in interpreting legal precedent. And so you'll see other studies that say, so there was a guy that in New York City, he submitted a brief to a judge written by ChatGPT. And if you Google it, like there's a bunch of news about it. Um, and the judge was like, what in the world is this? It didn't make sense. It wasn't coherent. It was hallucinating stuff. The guy just literally didn't read it over. And this is our point that we've made before, which is AI is just going to make you more of what you already are. It's not going to make you better at what you are. So that guy clearly was an average or below average lawyer. He assumed GPT was good at its job, but it's only as good as the person refining it. It'll make you work faster, but you still have to know like, oh, that's a hallucination. That's not accurate. That doesn't apply to New York law. Or you need to put this in a different phrase or, or whatever. And then it probably would have done his work not in one one hundredth the time, which is what he anticipated, but maybe in one tenth the time. So that type of stuff, I've talked to several lawyers, with a brother-in-law that's a lawyer, and he said everybody, and he's in New York, he has his, his offices in Manhattan, um, so not too far from where this issue happened. And he said, now everybody in New York is treading very lightly with AI, which is the wrong approach, <laughs> right? Just because one guy didn't do well, that doesn't mean the whole thing should be thrown out. If I was a law firm, I'd be acting like we are with our marketing firm which is all in, figure it out, screw up, learn from your mistake, keep going, right? And something we learned three weeks ago is irrelevant today because of the new version or, you know, GPT-4 replaced what we did in GPT-3.5 or custom GPTs or pre-chain models for Gemini or Gemini has a larger trigger. Like it's moving so fast that you can't expect what I learned a month ago to still be relevant. Right. However, that doesn't mean you don't learn anything. That doesn't mean you just say, let me let somebody else solve this problem. If that's your approach, they will solve that problem and they'll put you out of business in the meantime. So does that does that resonate? I don't know if you guys have had other personal experiences with people that seem to be reluctant to accept the full range of capabilities of what AI tools can do. Oh, absolutely, Brett. It's full of them. Absolutely full. Is it? Oh my gosh, man. If you get onto Reddit and you go into just about any subgenre that's talking about AI, uh, whether it's AI in sports or AI in uh, medicine or AI in literature, because I look at a lot of that stuff, they absolutely flat out refuse to believe that it is possible, one, for AI to write anything that's good, two, for AI to be able to analyze anything that's good. These people flat refuse to believe that it's possible for a transformer to analyze text. There's a guy who claims he's from Stanford who swears up and down it's impossible for a transformer to be able to analyze text and tell you whether or not it's coherent. Do they give reasons for that? Because my example is people don't really give reasons. They're kind of just burying their heads in the sand. Usually the way it goes in Reddit is people make these wild claims. They say something's not possible. They toss around words like... Uh, adversarial networks and I went to Stanford and you're an idiot and then it devolves into you know all kinds of insanity and no people really don't back up what they say they don't go back and look at things like in 2017 the year Transformers came out 
That was the first year that we started using text things to be able to analyze. In 2019, Disney was actually starting to create uh, their first little analyzation tools to be able to look at story and plot and analyze them. That's the first year a short story analyzer came out. And I can tell you from personal experience that here in 2023 and 2024, you can do some very in-depth analysis on text and get a good idea of what your pacing is like, your uh, narrative flow, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. You can really get a good idea and you can do some simulations. And this is using transformers. I mean, that's- yeah, I think the challenge is it's difficult for people to look at first principles. So if I make a statement that a GPT cannot analyze text, I have to go back to the first principle. Okay, what is text? What is wording? What is What are sentences and paragraphs and stories? Right. Okay, well, how do we learn that? How does the human mind adapt and absorb this information? Can that process be replicated through a non-biological entity, through a machine, through a computer? And the best I can tell the answer to all of that is yes. Absolutely. You just I can't see any physical limitation to a GPT that would not allow it to follow the patterns of information, which is what grammar is, right. which is what speech is. And so engineering for the longest time, we've had finite element analysis and things like that, that, that you could do all the manual calculations, but mm -hmm. computers were able to do it much faster. And that was following a pattern, understanding the stresses and the material structures and those types of things that, that were all part of the variables. There are different variables in language I mean, there was an experiment recently where they took a language that only 200 people in the world speak. And there was a essentially outline or a notebook of some sort that explained the syntax of the language and so on. And the GPT learned it within a few hours and could communicate back and forth on just this sort of one text mm -hmm. describing it, right? Mm -hmm. That's the type of thing that says... Yeah, it can learn syntax. Now, the challenge with it, and this is where I think people get caught up, Chuck, and maybe you've seen this as well. If my training of this GPT, like ChatGPT or, or Gemini, is internet-wide, there is a lot of junk on the internet. And so I have a conversation with it, and I ask it to write some sort of story or whatever, and it hallucinates, or it makes up something that sounds plausible, you know, but isn't true, or it says something that's just weird like it just doesn't add up well it's gathering that from somewhere if you took a gpt and trained it only on a pre-trained i would say gpt but then you trained it on a unique data set like legal stuff like we were talking about before the actual laws of the state of new york or of new york city or i don't know if they have county level or municipality level and so on it's going to be really good probably better than any <laughs> lawyer could absorb uh, if you give it all the case history, all the case laws, all the decisions, and you just trained it on that and you ignored all this junk that's on Reddit or wherever, because it's it's not weighing these in a different level. So if it has a Reddit discussion talking about some sort of legal precedent or what? issue, what is that it? thousand words is the same as this thousand words over here that actually is case law. <clears throat> and this is where I think people get caught up. They don't realize that those two things have equal weight, essentially, in the GPT. And I I think I'm saying that right, but Greg or Chuck, you can correct me if, if weight isn't the right way to, to explain that. Uh, but if you actually trained it specifically for the task at hand, then it's not going to get so confused. And, and it's amazing what these things can do without being you know, specifically trained, just being trained on the whole of the internet using custom GPTs or pre-trained models and things like that, where you can focus it in. I've, I've really got scratched the surface. I've, I've really gotten into this whole local model thing uh, using Olama and you can download all kinds of models. Uh, Gemma, uh, I've been playing a lot with Llama 2, uh, Llama 2 Uncensored. And there's instructions in there for adding your own training, training these models further on different data sets. And you can find some people have taken Llama 2 and they've added medical data to it, or they've taken uh, Mistral and they've added uh, law data and stuff to it. So people are starting to take these models and they're completing training out. Uh, of course, yeah. the GPUs to be able to do that. But if you're willing to use uh, Amazon or Microsoft servers or something like that, that's trivial at that point. You know, you don't have to actually own the hardware to train the model. But those models then can run on local systems or 
wherever you want trained on your specific data. So if you're in like the state of uh, Colorado, you have laws that are specific to uh, the state of Colorado or to Denver. You can have those models funneling right. down for those uh, localities and stuff and really tune them up. And you do get rid of a lot of the hallucination stuff when you fine tune these models and you don't use one that's trained off the entire internet or trained off of everything that was on Twitter. You know, they did that a few years back. They trained models based off of Twitter and they s released a bot on that. And it almost instantly turned uh, extremely hateful, rude. Uh, it was Yeah, Microsoft Tay. Yeah, yeah. So see, it really- I think it lasted 16 hours. <laughs> yeah. It depends on what you train that model with, you know? Uh, so start with a really slim model and train it for the specific tasks that you're having. You don't have to have a conversational bot. You know, you can have one that just returns data simply. You don't have to have one that feels like a person or anything. Well, and that's one of the ones that we want to work on is the the bots right now that use research data only read the abstracts and don't yet interpret the actual data. And that's a big limitation. No. So, you know, then you have to train your own. It will be interesting though, because there is some discussion and this will be, I don't have a good prediction on this because it's it's really hard to understand how these things are going to work. But the GPT-5 levels, the advantages of localized models trained on just local data versus your local data plus the entire internet is going to be negligible as the current claim. Uh, and that's, that's possible. I wouldn't rule that out, that if it's trained that well, that as long as you have the data within the data set, it's not going to be advantageous to break it out and only have that data. Right. And we'll see. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to doing some testing on that to see if that's true. Hey, what last few days I've been playing a lot with AI Studio with uh, Gemini's 1.5 preview. I was disappointed with it at first. Uh, I've tried a couple of times to play with it. And oh, Greg, you'll like this. I actually found out what I needed to do to make it like cool. Turn off all the safety stuff. Yeah, yeah. all of it. <laughs> Turn all the safety stuff off and it ceases to be this stiff robotic i mean you can't get anything out of it that's of any real use i mean it's like just it's like yeah. spot dude it's like a vulcan that's just spitting out me but you turn off all that safety stuff and it gets a little bit of life and and that's important if you're working on narratives whether it's fiction or non-fiction or you're trying to create blog posts you need life you need it to feel real and you can't do that when you have all that safety stuff turned on because it's I mean, <laughs> dude, it just can't quite talk right or something. So if you turn the safety off, Chuck, you should try if you haven't already. My little experiment with, create, help me create a presentation on the five myths atheists or five miracles that were all atheists and myths, except or the opposite. Yeah, you know, help me create a presentation of uh, why faith is, um, what was the wording I was using? Redundant because of evolution. You know, and see if it'll help you with either one. It, the current all safety features on default Gemini won't help me. It just says you need to broaden your horizons and be more objective and try not to offend anyone and whatever. So I'm curious if with the safety off, we can actually get some help on more nuanced discussions. Yeah, yeah. You might play with the temperature settings just a little bit too, because when I took it down to uh, 0.8, it seemed to spice things up a little bit when it was rewriting some stuff. I'm not going to use any of the stuff that came out of Gemini because I've all the book stuff I'm doing with uh, ChatGPT, I'm pretty happy with right now. So I'm going to finish out the first four with that. And maybe on my second set of books, I might uh, might come in and look at uh, Gemini for doing them. Because it's just that token size, man, that prompt size. It's huge. I love it. I'm curious, Chuck, have you seen this? I kind of know the answer before I ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you seen anybody actually change somebody's mind on Reddit about the capabilities or even in personal conversation that like, no, it's never going to drive my the truck or no, it's never going to be able to write a novel. And like, well, here's actually an example. And No, in fact, <laughs> I've actually been accused of waking Anton of writing the entire thing. I wrote, I wrote it, I guess. I wrote the entire book because AI has no creativity. It was all my ideas. Uh, the AI just uh, wrote pieces and chunks. You know, I did record myself talking an awful lot. So I get that. I, I do understand that point that maybe AI didn't write the story, but it definitely did. I don't. So I guess, I, I guess mean, it comes down to what your opinion is of I writing mean, a story. Yeah. Well, if, it's, if it's coming up with every single or the concept of the story, 
then yes, you had to at least prompt it to come up <laughs> with certain concepts and ideas and that. So I'm sure you were to actually get off the text out and the plot and the characters and the details and that kind of stuff is part of writing the story that you didn't do totally. Yeah. Like there's obviously assistance there. And so if it I just depends really on their definition of writing the story. I didn't even have wrote 20. I don't know. Somewhere between 10 and 20% is what I wrote of that thing. Um, well, I think people might take it to an extreme and they're like, did you tell it, write me a book called Waking Anton and it spit it out. And it's absolutely like, no, not. That's not how it works. There's people who are upset that, that that's a possibility. And there are people who are upset that that's not what I did. Or that, you, you know, it's so bizarre. People are never happy about anything. <laughs> <laughs> they just can't be happy with it but here's the point it's a collaborative tool and i think we see this across industries i don't think we'll get rid of doctors i think we have a doctor shortage in this country and what we're going to find are more effective doctors we're going to find registered nurse practitioners who have like the best medical knowledge in the world in the palm of their hand so that when they're talking to patients they have that effective ability that knowledge to collect what information they need so that they can help those people better. So I, I don't see it as replacing tons and tons of people. Certainly there are industries where people get replaced, but I don't think that that's going to be the norm here. I think it's a collaborative tool. I mean, I'm a software developer. You'd think it'd be replacing me, but I don't see it replacing me. I see it empowering me. I've been able to create things in like hours that would have taken me days before. So I think the key here is if you're in it, right, but I would say then, sorry, go ahead, finish. I was going to say, if you're in an industry where you think a knowledge industry where you think your job might be replaced, I think you need to start looking at the technology and seeing how you can use the technology to become more effective at what you do because it's not going to replace you if you're using it. So, I would have one nuance then and I'll sort of switch to you, Rob, um, <laughs> which is if you're mediocre at whatever you do. If you're a mediocre doctor, if you're a mediocre lawyer, if you're a mediocre marketer, mediocre accountant, and nobody wants to admit that they are, but you probably are, um, then AI isn't actually going to help you. And this is where I think there, there's another dichotomy, right? So you need to be really good at what you do, because if you're not in the top, let's just say 20%, probably 5% is real, more realistic, but at least 20% of what you do, then the top 20% people are going to use AI to get 10 times better. So they can be able to do 10 times more work and the work that you're doing isn't going to be needed because it's not good enough. So just if I'm in the middle percent here and I'm not in the top 10% or whatever, using AI isn't yet going to help me. Like you need to start getting familiar with it and understand how it works, but you actually have to be good at your thing, whatever it is, because the people that are good are going to replace you by just getting 10 times more efficient. So I think people will get replaced. And I think those people, whether it's a truck driver or whether it's uh, you know, a doctor that isn't interested in having an AI tell them how these supplements that this person's taking is related to their blood work and is related to their medical history, that the doctor doesn't make any of those connections, right? There's going to be doctors that just are like, oh, I'm the doctor. I don't need that, right? Or the lawyer who thinks he knows better than what the AI can help. So uh, there definitely will be people replaced. I, I would disagree with that. But you don't have to be one of those people I do agree with. <laughs> well, I, I think we have this unique situation where our population continues to grow and grow and grow. So by the time people get replaced, we need more doctors. So I don't see I don't see like a glut. I don't oh, wait a sec. That's the, totally not true globally. Well, no, that's not true globally. China is going for a major population uh, China. collapse. Oh yeah. China China's gonna drop their population in half by twenty fifty. Right. Mm -hmm entire middle generation over there i yeah. mean it's a big part of their push right now they're trying to push their influence so that they can get support for that generation the the only countries that are growing are ones with significant immigration god bless the usa i guess so yeah so maybe in the, in the usa it's fair to say we're growing but it's definitely not fair to say globally that's the case sorry go ahead rob I don't know how much time we've got for this, but it's related to what you two are speaking about and your cousin. Uh, so from what I'm hearing and all the things we're reading, AI is obviously really polarizing. So there's two groups, the ones who think it's going to be good, the ones who think it's going to be bad. But actually there's a third group and the third group might be the biggest group 
from what I'm seeing in general life. And the third group is the people that just bury their heads in the sand. So yes. what does this mean for society? Like, are we just going to sleepwalk our way into war or into something like an authoritarian society in places that were previously democratic? Is the pay gap going to increase? What's going to happen? So there's, there's <clears throat> opportunity there and there's challenges, right? So the opportunity is if you're one of the people that's not burying your head in the sand and you're good at your craft and you're willing to use AI to get better. So you're a writer and you don't say, well, AI will never be able to do what I do. Okay, so if you're not that person, so you're a brilliant writer, but you're just not willing to embrace AI, like you're going to be in trouble. If you're a mediocre writer and you embrace AI, you're going to be in worse trouble because you're just going to be you know, mediocre faster. Yeah. Uh, so if you are willing to look up from your smartphone and your social media and these types of things and, and dig in and get good at something, then there will always be opportunity for you. Always. The majority of society, I don't know that it's, I don't know what happens there. Like there will be, I believe, significant layoffs. They will start with knowledge workers. Uh, you won't need, I mean, I know I have technology that will replace 80% of what our architectural engineers do and about 80% of what patent attorneys do. And, you know, uh, I mean, you can go down the list. Medical is interesting because there's a shortage. And I think the shortage is at two levels. One, it's just actual doctors to see patients, but that actually, that, that, uh, that, uh, let me see, that creates a separate issue, which is a doctor should be spending 30 minutes with you getting to know you and they spend five. So there's a huge shortage, I would say, not just in doctors seeing patients, but in the time spent. And so if you had more time for the doctor to think about your issues and your situation and your diet and what you're doing, the stresses in your life and so on, and it's a 30 minute probably discussion every time you go to see your doctor, not a five minute, 10 minute discussion. Yeah, that becomes a whole different paradigm in healthcare. So that one is, is unique. Um, I hope we don't get 10 times more legal services. But I think there will be, it's inevitable there's going to be layoffs. There will, there, there will be opportunities. Does that lead to war? Man, I, I'm not a fan of using AI to, you know, execute kill orders. I yeah. don't like, I, I think there's a big moral and ethical issue with AI identifying targets and, you know, destroying them or killing people or whatever. Uh, I mean, there's a moral and ethical issue when humans do that. <laughs> but it's... AI is very currently very prone to misidentification with facial recognition and things like that. So that one is concerning because it's already being deployed. Does that make it worse? I I have no idea. That's a good question. I have to think about that one a little bit more because we're already in how many wars across the world? Uh, uh, you know, at least three or four major ones. I don't know. I'll tell you the war stuff. It's uh, it's pretty bad. But honestly, in the last year, we've had fewer deaths from wars than we did the year before that. Globally, isn't that weird? Like in Yemen, like two years ago, there was a child dying every fourteen seconds, but nobody cared. But you know, it just depends on the news and the media. It's what they throw into you, what they put into our minds, what they want us to believe. It's the narrative that they want us to follow along. The truth and the reality is here in the industrialized world, we are wealthy beyond belief. We have so much food, agriculture, our people will not starve. I mean, the United States, Europe, it would take a huge famine, like a two or three year famine for our people to starve. There's chunks of Africa that are like that. Australia is like that. We have power, we have heat, we have warm, we have homes. Yeah, there's homeless. Yeah, there's migrants. There's people that are having bad problems. That's always going to be that way. But you have to look at the bigger picture of things. Are things going to collapse? Probably. Look at the global economic situation. The United States is not going to be able to continue making its interest payments. So what's going to happen? We're going to default. And when we default, our entire economy is going to collapse. China is in the same situation. It's teetering. Their economy is teetering. So we have to have this gigantic economic reset. And along with that comes a lot of societal resets. But this is the nature of life. It comes every generation. 
We had our World War I's and World War II's. We had our Korea's and our Vietnam's. That's the Western world side. And the other side of the world, we've had similar things. These are cycles that we as a species continue to follow through. AI is a new thing and it's definitely going to impact us, but it alone is not going to be what collapses society. We won't see that. We might see cities fall. We might see the coasts flood some. We might see people moving in mass migration, but it will not be the end of the world. AI is not going to kill everybody. It's not going to destroy everything. What it will do is it will help us prepare for these things. It will help us understand that, yeah, we're getting high flood waters. Yeah, our polar caps are collapsing. We need to start building our cities different. We need to start building better foundations. We need to start doing this. And we need to start doing that. Guys, it's not going to all happen in one year or two years, seven, 10, 15, 20. It takes time. It'll take time to replace all the truck drivers because you have to build the trucks. You have to build the machines. Who's doing that? Where's the infrastructure for that? Where are these things coming from? Who's delivering them? Who's teaching people how to set them up? Who's doing the software on all of those? There is no shortage of jobs in any of this automation stuff. It's just that the jobs people will be doing is a lot different from the jobs they're doing right now. We're automating, 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 but we're also growing, 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 growing. So we need more and more and more. So people will continue to do things. It's just they won't continue to do the same things. There'll be parts of the world that collapse and fall because of economic and wars. There'll be parts that rise up. It, it'll be the same here in Europe or in the United States and in Europe. There'll be parts of the country that prosper really well, but there'll be other parts that collapse. It's all around the world. It's just a cycle, guys. I think we've got all of our shots this week from Chuck in that three-minute monologue. It's perfect. <laughs>